Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, it's, uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming to the today's seminar. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Yang Lo Kun from uh, Meta AI as our speaker today. So, uh, but first, our Baidu CTO, Dr. Hai Feng Wang, would like to give the welcome remark to Yang and to the audience. So, uh, Hai Feng is a Baidu Chief Technology Officer. While he remains to be an active researcher in many areas of AI and deep learning, uh, in particular, natural language processing, like machine translation, pre-trained language models, knowledge graphs, et cetera, and such technologies, of course. Uh, please welcome Hai Feng. Okay. Uh, hello, Yang. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Baidu. It's the second time for Yang to visit Baidu, virtually this time. The first time it was in 2013. Yang visited Baidu in the second Baidu Technology Summit. I still remember his fantastic talk in deep learning. Nearly 10 years have passed, and deep learning as well, everyone knows has transformed every aspect of machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence in industry as well as academia. Now, today, Yan is here again, and uh, we will learn his amazing thoughts about AI. Let me give a brief introduction to our today's speaker, Dr. Yan Lakun. Currently, he is the chief AI scientist at Meta and a senior professor at NYU. He is also a member of US National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, among uh, and other honors. Yang was recognized as one of the three deep learning pioneers and was honored with the Asian Tooling Award for conceptual and engineering brief rules that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. So I'm so glad to have you here. Please do visit us again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Haifo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a great introduction. So actually in 2013, I remember I also invited Yan to Rutgers University. I think it's in 2013, if Yan remembers. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's such a coincidence. So great. Uh, so I, this is- I also, Yeah, I, I visited Baidu uh, the same year um, uh, in the building that we can see right behind Haifeng actually. <laughs> yes. Uh, great. So, uh, so this is the agenda for today. So before the research talk, so I thank Yan for agreeing to do this uh, 30 minutes session for conversation with Yan Lokun. Um, so, so basically it's an informal, like a, like a panel. So we have a, a number of uh, a special invited guests who will uh, reserve the slots to ask Yan some questions. And uh, just, uh, this is just for fun and for education, of course. And uh, so hopefully the, the audience will enjoy that as well. So uh, first, uh, uh, let's see. So we have a uh, uh, so uh, Li Deng and Dr. Li Deng and uh, Dr. Andrew Matanari. And uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. So uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Uh, Li Deng. Uh, ask questions. So, so uh, uh, first, uh, let me introduce a little bit about uh, Dr. Li Deng. So, uh, welcome, Li. So, Li received uh, the 2015 IEEE Signal Processing Society Technology Achievement Award for the outstanding contributions to automatic speech recognitions and to deep learning. And he also received the 2019 IEEE Industry Leadership Award for the leadership in pioneering research and development on large scale deep learning. That, if, uh, that disrupted the worldwide speech recognition industry and for leadership in natural language processing and financial engineering. Uh, so Lee is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering. He was the chief, science, uh, chief AI uh, officer at the Citadel America. And before that, he was a chief scientist of AI and head of uh, deep learning and technology center at Microsoft. And currently he's also advising several AI startups in Silicon Valley and is affiliated professor at University of Washington. So Lee, welcome to Baidu again, and please uh, share your question to Yang. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, yeah. Um, so I have, yeah, thank you very much. I've listened to many of your talks. I enjoy every single 
minutes, you know, when I was interacting with you uh, many years ago <laughs> before I joined hedge fund company. So during my Microsoft, I, um, you know, I learned so much from you. Now, after I went to a hedge fund a company, I encountered so many different problems and they don't allow me to say anything outside. But now there's an opportunity. I, I can make an exception to ask you a question, hoping to get, you know, some insight from you uh, about, you know, some of the challenges that our industry is facing is financial engineering uh, challenges. So we saw part of the problem using deep learning and there are still a few very important problems that we are yet to, uh, to solve. So the, the critical problem in financial market prediction really is to solve the problem of having very, very different distribution between training and test. This is the kind of problem that you talk about extra interpolation, extrapolation, and the one that Jan, uh, that Yasha Benjo and Jeffrey will keep talking about. So it's because the market changes very, very fast. I mean, because of a competition where right? everybody knows, you know, the distribution really changes so much. And then I recently read a paper you wrote with your colleagues about uh, in high dimensionality, you know, deep learning can do the kind of extrapolation rather than just thinking about doing interpolation. And that kind of insight really, you know, helped me to think about how to handle this kind of very fast, you know, non-stationary process where we are going to make a prediction on the market. This is very, very different than prediction in natural language where everything is static. You assume that, you know, uh, the distribution is not very different from each other. Whereas in financial market, it changes, just changes. And, but there is a specific reason why it changes. There is some economic laws that governs the competition and that change. So my question really to you is that, to what extent do you think the way that you think about interpolation, extrapolation, the generalization capabilities of deep learning network can be applicable to the problem where the distribution changes very fast, or very dramatic. And essentially, you really don't know what the next distribution is going to be. I'd, learn, I'd love to learn something from you on this. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in uh, financial prediction or, or financial markets at all. Uh, I've never, never quite worked in the area. But one thing I know about it is that, um, you know, it's very noisy. It's very noisy by definition because, uh, you know, the other uh, people kind of playing on the market are basically trying to make it unpredictable. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, exactly. Uh, and so the noise level is very high and the signal level is very low. And the, the yeah. big question here, I think, is, uh, not just how do you handle uh, non-stationary signal, but how do you handle uh, very high noise levels and yep. how do you handle uncertainty in the prediction? Uh, because it's not just a, a good thing to just predict, but it's also a good thing to know when your prediction is, is good or bad and, yep. uh, and, and produce you know, perhaps uh, uh, some sort of distribution over your, over your prediction, right? Yep. Um, yep. And so how do you handle noise? And in fact, this is, this is a problem that I'm, I'm really very interested in that I'll, I'll yeah. talk about in the technical part of the talk, uh, which okay. is how, you, how do you deal with uncertainty in prediction? And so yeah. if, okay. you're, if your goal is to really predict something and there is a, a large uncertainty in the prediction, it may actually be very difficult to do, but yeah. uh, if you give up the ability to predict the noisy signal, you just want to predict some representation of the noisy signal. Um, yeah. Like, you know, is it, it going to go up or down, you know, in the long run? Or, you know, is it a good thing to buy or whatever, right? Some yeah. other quantity that is not a direct prediction of the signal, but some, something that's, you know, simpler to predict. Um, then, it might be, then it might be possible yeah. to do a, a better job. So basically, I think uh, perhaps one of the issues that the machine learning community has had is to insist that uh, models should be uh, generative, essentially, or predictive. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. We should give up the idea that we should predict the variables that we want to model. Yeah. And so uh, okay. it, sounds, it sounds crazy when I say it like this, but I'll yeah. try to explain in the technical part of, uh, yeah. part of it. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this insight. Yeah. So I just so read- that, that, That's a question for noise, right? And then there is a non-stationarity and there, you know, uh, yeah. Of course, you know, things like self-supervised learning might help, but you know, in the context yeah. of financial markets, I really don't know. Yeah, okay, okay. So the, yeah, so the noise part is really the input and the output actually is the signal, but the signal actually is very often is a fake. Now when Trump have a tweet, things change. 
and after a while it comes down, right? Those are the kind of things we talk about as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as the noise. But on the other hand, um, there's an advantage of, um, of the kind of industry there because we kind of understood the reason why the noise is large and why there's a stationarity and why is it that you know, the distribution changes. And these three things are related to each other, right? You, you mentioned the noise. Noise actually, you know, it, it doesn't really deal with the direction, but we do know the kind of directional, uh, you know, aspect. But yeah. so the, the, the advantage of that industry is that we and sort of using economic theory, we understood the nature of the competition and how we have to model many, you know, multiple agent problems, and they are fighting with each other. We know they are doing this, and that gives some prior knowledge. And the key really is how to incorporate that prior knowledge into the model in such a way that. Uh, you know, the problem can become somewhat easier than otherwise impossible. Yeah. So, so compared to the kind of video prediction that you talk quite a bit about, you know, we actually try to use the similar kind of thing that you have to solve that problem. It turned out that it's all disaster. You will never be able to solve anything problem because, you know, the, the, the domain uh, information wasn't actually incorporated uh, at all, but you are using the, the type of, uh, you know, in many of the talks that I heard, you actually were using sort of, you know, it's not really noise the way to do video prediction, right? You actually assume that there are multiple uh, videos that can be predicted, right? And each of those should right. be, uh, and that's very, very thing, thing just doing, you know, the mean square error, you get all the, uh, you know, sort of um, very uh, difficult, you know, very noisy uh, sort of prediction coming up. You want to predict the clean trajectory, but there are multiple of those, you have to choose which one. It's good to be predicted in the video. It's very, uh, it's some of the different problem. But I think the prior yeah, yeah. knowledge about the, uh, about the, the structure of the output is something that ought to be uh, incorporated. So I'm looking forward to your uh, to your talk about technical solution to uh, uh, to this solution, and that well, hopefully will inspire our industry a little bit. So the second question: Do we have time to have a second question? I have only two questions. Yeah. So we have a we have a couple of more. Uh, more guests, so maybe can we? Can, uh, okay, uh, take a turn. Yeah, I'll, I'll save the next question after okay. uh, other people ask question. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, next, uh, let's welcome Professor Sanjeev Aurora from uh, Princeton University. Uh, uh, Sanjeev, uh, are you there? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, great. Hi, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me give one like thirty. 10 second introduction. So Professor Rona is with the Department of Computer Science at Princeton University. He has done great research. It's really great and uh, inspiring research in theoretical computer science and the recent years in theoretical machine learning. So uh, Professor Rona is a member of the US National Academy of Science. And uh, thank you for, for coming and please uh, start sharing your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Jan. Um, yeah, I haven't chatted with you in a while, you know, pandemic and all. Uh, and for the last 10 years, you've been always alerting me to the next big trend in your opinion. So what is that today? <laughs> I, I mean, in machine learning. In machine learning. Uh, well, it's a combination of two things. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, first of all, self-supervised learning. This is not news, of course. I've been talking about this uh, for a long time, including, you know, you and I have been talking about this for, for a while. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm so interested in self-supervised learning is uh, because if we want to build intelligent machines, we need to get them to learn to figure out how the world works, mostly by observation. And, uh, you know, self-supervised learning basically is kind of uh, a way to approach that problem. Um, and, uh, of course, I've been talking about this uh, quite a bit. And, um, uh, and, uh, and I think, um, you know, one approach to this, um, and again, I'm going to repeat what I... I, I, just, I just said to, to Lee, um, we may have to abandon the whole idea that we need to predict things. Um, we want to model the uh, dependencies between variables. Um, but um, if we want to train a, a system, for example, to uh, figure out how the world works by watching videos or by predicting what's going to happen in the video, there is no way that we can train a system to predict everything that's going to happen in the video down to the details of the texture of the carpet on the floor and the moving leaves on the tree. And so we have to abandon the idea that we need to predict. Basically, we have to give up generative models. And, and this is kind of uh, 
you know, sounds kind of unorthodox what I'm saying here. Um, but uh, but I, really, I really come to kind of believe that um, very strongly. So the next big thing is, uh, uh, I would say, non-contrastive methods for non-generative models. Okay, <laughs> defined it by negative negativity. But I, I'll say what I mean by that later. Oh, okay. okay, so I look forward to that. Uh, Andrew, you have more questions? <laughs> uh, no, I see you have many other questions, so I'll defer them. <laughs> okay, so. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, uh, so next, let's welcome Professor Andrew Martinari from Stanford University. So, uh, Andrew is with the Department of Statistics and Department of Mathematics and School of Engineering. So, uh, he has his. Uh, I, I, to me, he's a, is a highly accomplished researcher in many areas in statistics, mathematics, theoretical physics, and information theory and machine learning. So, Professor Martinari has received numerous honors and uh, he was uh, invited an uh, invited uh, speaker, a uh, session speaker at the 2020 International Congress of Mathematics. So uh, uh, Andrew, so uh, welcome to Baidu and, uh, and please hear your question. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Hi, Jan. So I thought of asking a, a, you know, a kind of uh, non-technical question, a sociological question. So this is a trend that I've witnessed for at least 15 years. Uh, before deep learning, but has been kind of enhanced by deep learning. It has been the convergence of various communities in the you know, computational sciences, applied mathematics, et cetera. If I think of perhaps 20 years ago, there was optimization and information theory and statistics and uh, theoretical computer science. And these were you know, well separate groups and they are progressively, you know, unifying in the sense that you know people think of the same problems and often use the same tools and of course there is a lot of of promise to that a lot of positive to that but okay the way i feel is that there is also some risks in the sense that often i see that different people think different things when they say I proved this, or I demonstrated this, or this is the right question, or this is the right problem. While you know, a smaller community has a very precise notion of what are the good problems and the good answer to those problems. And then different communities, of course, don't have the same idea of that. But at least within a community, that there is a kind of very precise notion of what is the standard of evidence, etc. Yeah, so I see this as, as a potentially risky, you know, a, a trend that has some risks in it. And I wanted to, you know, I have an idea what is your your opinion or your your feeling about that and you know what to do about it. Okay. Um, well I think um, I think it's good that people come to a field and contribute to it with very different um, sets of methods and very different way to approach the problem, very different ideas about what it means to prove something, very different strategy to come up with sort of, uh, you know, new models or new ideas or new explanations for them. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, Sanjeev invited me to uh, IAS to give a, a talk where, where the title was the epistemology of deep learning. And it was really about the fact that um, the, the, you know, certainly at the time, uh, much of deep learning was very, very much empirical. Um, it, was, it was very sort of, you know, creating an engineering artifact. Uh, and, and, and then we need to understand, uh, develop the theory that sort of explains what, why this artifact works and what the limits are. And that's where, that's where we need a, a very wide collection of people with different mindsets and different background cultures to, to help. So people coming from, uh, you know, probability theory, uh, you know, random matrix theory, large deviation, all that stuff, right? The community, you know, well, people coming from uh, information theory and, um, and uh, you know, applied math and et cetera, people coming from theoretical neuroscience, you know, people like, like Sanjeev who got interested in machine learning, you know, Boaz Barak from Harvard, you know, there's a whole bunch of people kind of, you know, started to get interested in this uh, coming from theoretical uh, computer science. And then physicists. Um, who are you know coming back to the to the field because they were interested in neural nets back in the late 80s early 90s and now they're coming back to uh, you know working on um, uh, you know analyzing kind of trying to understand what goes on in uh, uh, deep learning system 
you know, you know, with techniques that come from condensed matter uh, physics, essentially. I think we need all of this. You know, I, um, I'm fairly sort of uh, open to like different types of methodology because, um, you know, because I think we we need different ways to think about uh, problems that are that are that are complicated. So I don't I don't see an issue with the fact that people come with different standards. I, th I see this as a good thing. Great, thank you. <laughs> not not being a theoretician myself, you know, I don't. <laughs> uh, no, I, yeah, I uh, I kind of you know part of me completely agrees with you. <laughs> part of me is sometimes scared when I see a paper is published and people believe that that paper proved something. <laughs> And then you read yeah. the paper, and uh, it's not the yeah. case. I mean, clearly, uh, you know there are um, there, there are proofs whose uh, applicability you know is fairly re uh, restricted, and 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 you you know you have to to know exactly what the conditions in which the proof apply. Yeah. But sometimes you know proofs that seem completely ironclad can actually send you in a in a wrong direction, right? So there was a time, you know, before deep learning was popular, where, uh, you know, you would talk to the theoretician about machine learning and the theoretician would tell you, you know, it's very easy. You can approximate any function you want by, you know, taking your input, uh, expanding it on a very large dimensional uh, uh, set of basis function using a nonlinear function. And then everything becomes linear in that space. So now I, I just need to do, you know, uh, convex optimization. Um, and and then you had to you know talk to them and convince them that uh, to make a complex function uh, tractable or practical, you know you have to ha um, you have to let it have several steps, you know sequential steps, meaning layers in a uh, in a neural net, or it could be steps in a program or whatever, right? Um, and that the theory basically cannot you know could not you know make that visible, and so. Um, so there was a very kind of difficult dialogue with, with theoreticians at the time. It's changed since then, at least with some of them, not all of them, I should say. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, sometimes uh, things that are proved um, turn out to be misleading, even though they're right. I, I completely agree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jean-Claude, you have your hand he's not a theoretician. This reminds me like, uh, I think in 2010, right, I invited Yan to Cornell to give a talk and during the dinner in the Thai restaurant. <laughs> I was not remember the restaurant to give a talk. So, uh, so uh, Yan told us the story when Yan was young and he derived uh, some uh, beautiful theorems, uh, which he thought that was very creative. It's, it's a hard derivations, but un until later he found out it's actually called the martin Pasteur law in random matrices. Uh, yeah, so uh, so uh, so that's uh, like uh, making me like uh, it's enough evidence uh, that uh, uh, Yang is actually theoretically uh, uh, well prepared and uh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah I, mean, I, I had some help with this. I was working with a, a physicist who did all the replica symmetry breaking calculation, which I couldn't possibly do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you was a good story, and uh, uh, so um, so Eric, are you here? Yeah, I, I don't say which Eric, otherwise, <laughs> Eric. Okay, so uh, so let's go to the next uh, uh, question. So by, uh, I'd like to invite someone from Baidu Research to give uh, to ask a question. So uh, Jian Wenxie, and uh, he he graduated PhD from UCLA in the in the C computer vision group with uh, Song Chun and uh, Yun Lian, and uh, he will uh, have some questions for you. So uh, Jian Wen. Uh, hi, Professor Raku. Uh, welcome to Baidu. Yeah, I have one uh, fundamental question related to uh, general AI for you. Uh, nowadays, uh, we have seen a, a great success of uh, deep learning in terms of uh, performance in uh, all kinds of AI tasks. Uh, do you think a uh, grammar-like uh, representation, uh, for example, uh, NL graph or passing tree uh, is still missing in the uh, state of the other AI system and uh, deep learning methods? So that the uh, learned knowledge uh, lack explainability. Uh, if the answer is yes, uh, how can we achieve it? If not, uh, why? Uh, I, would, I want to listen to your opinion. Thanks. Okay, I, I, think, I think there are two questions in your, in your question, right? One question is, uh, how can we get 
uh, machine learning systems or deep learning system in particular to represent complex objects that are structured. So things like, like trees and graphs, as opposed to just, you know, multidimensional arrays, right? Which is basically what, uh, uh, what deep learning system can manipulate today. Um, I mean, I'm sort of excited by the whole sort of graph neural net uh, or geometry deep learning uh, thing. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's uh, kind of um, full of potential. Maybe not mm -hmm. for the kind of uh, AI that we're talking about, but, uh, you know, certainly for applications to, um, to data that, that do not come to you in the, in the form of, uh, you know, multidimensional arrays, but uh, in the form of functions on a graph, for example. So, um, so I find this really exciting. Um, I think there's a lot to be discovered there, and a lot to be explored. Um, and then, um, and, and then there is the, the, another question kind of wrapped in, in your question, which I failed to remember. <laughs> um, um, yeah, actually it's a, a, only a, a one question. So uh, uh, is, uh, do you think the grammar-like representation is missing in the current uh, deep learning network? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think what's missing certainly is uh, reasoning and I'll address that in the talk, but um, I think the ability of deep learning system to reason, I think, uh, you know, would be really, really powerful. The, the, the main mm -hmm. issue there is that traditional types of reasoning that are based on uh, symbols and logic basically are incompatible with gradient based learning, right? Because they manipulate discrete objects with sort of discrete functions. And so if you're gonna, you know, train a system using gradient-based learning, that's, you know, basically not going to work. So, so that's the big question. How do you replace symbols by, uh, you know, vector of activities, basically representing symbols by, by a vector or by, you know, some, some numerical object and then replacing mm -hmm. numerical operation, uh, replacing logical operations by numerical ones, um, essentially. But there was another piece to your question initially, which was about ex explanation. So right. I have a rather unorthodox opinion about explanation, which is that um, I don't believe that explainable AI is particularly useful. Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's useful for bad reasons. It's useful because it's, uh, it's useful for an AI system to provide explanation because it reassures uh, the, the people that, that use it, but it's not actually useful, okay? Okay. Um, and, you know, people are kind of uh, hesitant to use a system whose functioning they don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, mm -hmm. we, we, we work with uh, other humans and we don't understand how they work mm -hmm. at all. Um, we, take, uh, we take drugs uh, for various elements whose mechanism of action is not understood. Uh, but they're efficacy has been proven by, uh, you know, decades of testing, of careful testing. So I think, you know, there are certainly some situations in which an AI system has to be able to provide an explanation. There's no question about that. But for most uh, applications of AI, uh, I, I don't think providing uh, explanations is particularly useful. Okay, yeah, thank you for uh, sharing. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Yan. Uh, do you mind delay your talk by five minutes? Well, you, you, you only committed to it till 8.30, so we'll no, maybe... No, okay. I don't mind. Okay. So uh, I, saw, I saw Ken raise, uh, raise a hand. So, so Ken and Yan, you were colleagues by at and Lab. So. That's yeah. right. Oh, at Bell Hi, Ken. <laughs> oh, at Bell Lab. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Ken. Hi. Um, I'm uh, trying to unmute and un... I don't know why my machine is being so sluggish. Any rate, um, so I, I raised a question in the chat with uh, Li Dong. You were yeah. sort of suggesting that um, um, adversarial um, sort of things like you might get in a stock market or something where the other traders are all trying, are, are not randomly trading, but they're, they're actually out to get you. Um, and I'm thinking that, you know, I, I once heard somebody suggest that we could build a machine to play chess by sort of assuming the other player is playing randomly. But in fact, I think it's important to think that the, the adversary is, is actually out to get you. And so, you know, you were sort of suggesting that you could respond to uh, uh, some of the things that Li Dong was talking about, like thinking that it's random noise. And I'm thinking it's, it's quite precisely non-random noise. 
you should be much more paranoid than than just you know random noise. Anyway, that was just a comment. Yeah, yeah I okay. agree. I agree. Yeah. I'll, I'll think about that as the parallel noise, right? Something like that. <laughs> but is there any kind of machine learning that you know about that may address this type of? I mean, again, it's one way of doing that, right? You know, but it's a very primitive way of thinking about that, uh, doing that. So I wonder whether uh, you know you can yeah. offer some structure well, well, like, kind of knowledge yeah, to solve that. A shot at, it, at answering that. Yeah. Well. Um, you know, I think uh, if you have, if you need to use a, a world model for an AI system to predict what's going to happen, you know, possibly as a consequence of its actions, uh, if there is uncertainty in the world, that predictor needs to have some latent variable that accounts for all the stuff you don't you don't know, um, and and so um, you know the stuff you don't know includes if you're if you're playing an adversarial game, it includes what your adversary is going to play, and you can try to assume that it's going to play. Uh, you know, the best uh, possible, what you think is the best uh, possible move uh, against you. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, in situations that are not particularly adversarial, uh, you, you, you still have to figure out, you know, what, what is going to happen. Like, you know, you're driving on the, on the highway and, uh, you know, there are cars around you and, it, you know, it's a good idea to be able to predict what's going to, what the cars around you are going to do to kind of, uh, drive safely and defensively, and they're not necessarily adversarial, um, but the number of different things they can they can do is very large. And so, how do you sort of represent in your mind, you know, all the possible futures that that may that may happen, and sort of, um, uh, you know, you, you can model this by essentially what amounts to a latent variable. Here is everything I don't know about the world. And when I change this latent variable, my prediction varies over a set of plausible, uh, plausible futures. Um, and if I know the uh, the world is adversarial, then I pick a value for the latent variable that uh, you know maximizes maximizes my cost. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And and the stock, I mean, certainly the stock market is like that, right? Except you you yeah. don't have one adversary; you have a whole bunch of them. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I, I'd like to ask again. So, Eric, are you, are you here? Uh, otherwise, we conclude this uh, session of a uh, conversation session. Uh, thank you, Yan. This is, this is very fun. For those uh, who have uh, still have questions, so we, we can leave the questions after the talk. And uh, uh, I need to tell Yan that uh, we don't really have a, a time limit. Uh, so I hope Yen doesn't mind to stay till 8.30. Uh, yeah, so uh, since we only have like 17 minutes, let's use it uh, very cautiously. Uh, so let's make sure the questions are first focus on, focus on questions that's relevant to the talk. And okay. also, also I'd like to uh, see this also opportunity to for friends to say hi to, to Yen. And uh, I see like, uh, I see for example, Yima from Berkeley, and uh, and also uh, ST Yao from Harvard. Oh, okay, ST Yao, he just left. So yeah, if you want to say hi to to Yan, so this is a good opportunity. <laughs> I'm yeah. flattered that you guys showed up. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Maybe I'll answer the first question. All right. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is a great talk. Okay. Um. So the reason why you gave up uh predicting images at the Pixel level is because it never worked well in your experiment, or is it something that you don't see the need of predict the pixel in order to achieve your goal of learning the world model for your Jata architecture? It it works in simple cases. So if you're trying to predict uh, things like you know uh, green cars on a on a, on a black background or something like this, or you know uh, you know monsters moving in a video game or something like, like this, this, it works okay. But if okay. you want to apply it to like natural videos, um, no, it doesn't work. A lot of people are trying to do video prediction and they've huh. been really not doing okay. a good job. But otherwise I thought that, that, that it would be very, very useful in practice. Well, like in China, in China, for example, Baidu can produce the product where because in China, you know, video cameras all over the place, right? Sure. You can actually monitor the people. And if the criminal want to put out a gun or knife to do something before they do that, you know, police arrive already. It'd be very useful if you can predict maybe 10, you know, maybe 20 seconds or something. 
Okay, but, okay, that's good. Thank you um, very much. For uh, actually, actually, Lee, this is uh, important. So Baidu is, uh, I don't believe Baidu is uh, heavily involved in this in China. It's oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> this is important. Okay. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> and other, other questions? Uh, like uh, questions about EBM, questions about reinforcement learning. Uh, I saw some reinforcement learning experts here, like Chang Liu from University of Texas Austin. So, Professor Liu, do you have any general comments or questions? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, I actually want to ask about the contrastive versus uh, regularized methods. It looks to me that uh, both methods are very similar, right? So, you can almost view like contrastive methods as as some kind of approximation because the regularization is pushing everything uh, towards the data and that's like equivalent to penalize everything, every other data points, right? So you can almost think of a contrastive methods as a kind of Monte Carlo approximation to uh, the regularized methods. And, uh, and I, I also think that there are two different things that are slightly different. One is the traditional energy-based model where you, uh, uh, things like contrastive divergence. Uh, another is the more recent self-supervised learning, even though uh, both have this contrastive in the name, but I think they are somehow different. I can sort of say that the regularized methods is, uh, it has, has advantages over the contrastive methods for the self, in the self-supervised setting. But do you think the same holds for the energy for learning like Boltzmann distributions, like think, like uh, what, what, you know, uh, uh, like a contrastive, Divergence, uh, do, do you see a, a disadvantage over there as well? Yeah, so I, I think in fact that, uh, I think contrastive methods are the same all over. So things like contrastive divergence is a contrastive method. GANs are a contrastive method. Denosing autoencoders are a contrastive method. Siamese networks with positive and, and negative pairs are contrastive methods. They're all contrastive methods in one way or another. If you interpret them in the context of energy-based models, they're all they're all just different ways. Right. To, yeah, yeah, yes. To shut the energy because system. everything fundamentally, you have to do some contraction in order to learn these models, right? Right. But, but, the, yeah. but the, the point I'm making is that uh, when your representation space is high dimensional and your energy surface is very flexible, is, you know, has lots of parameters, for example, uh, mm -hmm. you're going to have to push up on a lot of places for it to take the right shape. Um, right. And, uh, and it might be, you know, it, it basically, you, it requires a, a number of contrastive samples that is exponential in, in the dimension. And so uh, it's doomed. I mean, there's no way this is going to scale up. Absolutely no way. That, that's, that's related to the Basically, hardness of the problem. Uh, I, I agree. Um, but, but in the end, you know, if you want to do the same thing in the high dimensional space, you have to somehow integrate over the high, high dimensional space using one way or the other, right? I was thinking, Contrastive methods is more like they're using Monte Carlo methods. Uh, regularization probably is something else. So let me let me give you an example. Okay, two examples. So the first example is k-means. So k-means can be viewed as an energy-based model, uh, where the the energy of a point in uh, in in white space. Okay, there's no x in k-means because it's completely unsupervised, right? So it's right, right, right. But the energy of a y is the the square distance to the closest prototype. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the energy surface is basically a bunch of quadratic balls centered on the prototypes, and it's the minimum of all those quadratic balls, right? Um, the volume of space that can take low energy is limited by, by k. <coughs> you only have k of those energy wells, and so the volume of low energy space is determined by that k, okay? Uh, right, right. It's a, it's a non-contrastive method. It's not regularized because k is fixed. But now let me take the example of a regularized method, sparse coding. So sparse coding, uh, you have a latent vector Z, uh, and you multiply it by a matrix, okay, a decoding matrix, a, si a single layer, and your energy function is the squared reconstruction error. So the difference between your Y vector and uh, Z multiplied by uh, the, uh, the W matrix, and then there is an ad additional term which is the L1 norm of z multiplied by some coefficient, right? So this term is a regularizer that says, I make you pay for setting too many components of the z vector uh, to non-zero values, right? And the result right. of this is to limit the volume of white space that can take low energy. 
And you don't have to appeal to any probabilistic arguments. You don't have to appeal right. to any contrastive thing. Uh, you just have a regular riser that limits the volume of stuff that can take low energy, you know? And I'm looking for other algorithms like this. And uh, basically I was looking for one that would work for joint embedding architectures. Right, 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 I see. Yeah, yeah, I, I see your point. I, I see your point. Uh, the difference here is that the model are different, right? So if you're learning a general energy model where the energy is a you know, complicated neural network, well, you have to kind of integrate and then you have to do some approximation. But now if you have a simpler model and maybe a, a smart way to, you know, manipulate models so that you, you don't have to do the integration, um, but still achieve something similar. I, I agree. Thank you, Professor Liu. Uh, yeah, I saw I saw I saw Kim Ma from uh, from Google. That would be a very relevant person to ask questions. Uh, he just laughed, so I did not oh. catch him. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, actually, Yima, do you would you like to say hi? <laughs> yeah, hi. Google. Yeah. Uh, how are you? So I uh, so sorry I missed the first part of your talk. I had another meeting, but I uh, catch the end of it. But since uh, I follow up on the discussion, right? Um, I think I'm probably will go to fair give a talk. So you talk about this energy function, a measuring of contrastive or con uh, contractive. And one of the things we've been working on is actually based on this uh, information theoretical measure, yep. just yep. Yep. almost just a measuring the volume of the data. That's right. right. Um, just similar to what you mentioned, it's all a rate reduction, a rate distortion, and uh, uh, taking care of how really trace out the volume of the data, uh, especially the representation of the data. That could be one candidate for have you know uh, many interesting properties and uh, like so, similar so. to. I actually think about it as a general. Your example is perfect, right? The sparse model. And you can think about it, this is a more generalization of that to multiple low dimensional subspaces rather than just the more generic uh, sparse sparsity. So yeah, I should have mentioned that uh, Yi actually has proposed uh, probably one of the best alternative to Vcrag, perhaps a better one actually uh, called- uh, uh, Rate reduction. Squared. I mean, there's several- uh, Rate reduction, just uh, maximum rate reduction. It's essentially the volume of the whole minus the parts. Yeah. Right. So his method also uh, is a criterion on the covariance matrix of the activations of the code, which basically tries to uh, make the log determinant of the covariance matrix one. And that has the effect of making the covariance matrix uh, identity. So, so it's very similar to VCRAG. You know, it's a different formulation, but it's, you know, basically it's trying to do the same thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's a great alternative. In fact, uh, one of my postdocs, Yubei Chen, is actually using it. So, uh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll talk about I'll go to uh, Fair to talk about right. it. Yeah. I think I gave a similar talk uh, at the, the same event before. Yeah. Great, great. We'll have more chat about it. Thanks. Thank you. We should respect people who wrote questions on the chat box. So, I'll let Professor Yano Kuhn to decide which question to ask to answer. <laughs> Uh, Yan, do you, do you mind? Do you mind? Do you mind the <laughs> or just a sample, right? So any sample you like to. Okay, I'm going to start from the bottom then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, does the general JEPA system need bi level or multi level optimization to deal with the latent variable Z? Does that pose a problem for optimization? So, uh, that of course depends entirely on the precise architecture that you put, um, you know, inside the, the encoder and the predictor. Well, the encoder actually doesn't matter, but to make the to infer the latent variable, you basically you, you can do gradient-based methods. So you can backpropagate gradients of the reconstruction of the prediction cost through the predictor down to the latent variable and sort of optimize the latent variable this way by a gradient-based method. Um, if your predictor is not too complicated as a function of the latent, then you know it'll be simple. On the other hand, if your predictor is a really complicated function of your of your latent, then uh, it may not be that simple. So I, you know, that depends on the detail, and I can't I can't really give you a straight answer. We've done some experiments with kind of a you know a joint embedding architecture uh, based on images with two two images where the the predictor basically is trying to uh, predict a transformation between the two images. And it seems to work okay, but it's really preliminary. You know, we, we don't have any papers on this. By the way, I should mention that 
there's going to be a blog post about this that's going to be published by uh, Meta AI tomorrow, uh, which kind of explains some of the ideas that I talked about in this, uh, in this talk. And uh, I'm finishing a paper that kind of talks about all of this, which should appear over the next uh, couple of weeks or something like that. So you, you'll have uh, a written version of this if you want. Okay, what should we do next? Ping. Uh, up, up to you. Uh, or, or maybe shorter questions, like uh, in the new architecture, is there room for including <laughs> that shorter? Yeah. Accountability, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, okay. I mean, accountability here, if, if you think about, if by accountability you mean, um, uh, you know, can, can I align the behavior of my autonomous agent to um, so that, you know, it doesn't kill people and, you know, it does good things, etc. The place to do this would be inside of the intrinsic cost. So basically the intrinsic cost module is a set of immutable uh, cost functions. Okay. They are not trained. They're, they're hardwired. And they're there to essentially to do that, to drive the system towards certain behaviors and prevent it from adopting certain behaviors as well, right? So inside of these cost functions, you can, you can do things that would be difficult to program directly, right? It's easy to program a robot to uh, like, you know, not move its arm faster than a certain speed, right? Um, but, but, it, but there are certain behaviors that are easier to specify by a cost function than by uh, directly programming a behavior. So that's, that's how you would do it. You would, you would program it in, you know, as a, a module inside of the intrinsic cost, essentially. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so so if you ask me to pick one, so maybe, so can you summarize the one? So do you think the research paradigm of AI will be more like physics in the future? May the success of physics research inspired by AI community somehow? Yeah. Uh, by, by what? I'm sorry, I missed the word. Uh, May the success of physics research inspire the AI community somehow? And that's the question. And um, that's the that's the one, two, three, four, the from the bottom, the number four question. Four from the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Yes, oh, uh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Um I mean I'm a I'm a big fan of the connection between physics and machine learning for two reasons. Uh first because I think uh physics can bring methods to machine learning that I think are, are useful methodologies for you know, mathematical analysis of various kinds. So you see now uh, a community of you know, reasonably uh, large community of physicists, uh, mostly statistical physicists using uh, statistical physics methods to analyze the convergence, for example, or generaliz generalization properties of, uh, of deep learning system. And I think I think that's really interesting. So that's that's one thing is to use of physics methods to understand deep learning. Okay, uh, and certainly you know I talk about energy based models. Like all the math that is in there, essentially is derived from uh, thermodynamics, essentially from statistical physics. Um, now there is the other way around. Like can machine learning be useful for physics? And and there I think it can in different ways. So uh, one possible connection, which is a little kind of speculative at the moment, is the connection between uh, rever reversible models in machine learning and, and quantum physics, or quantum computing in particular. Um, I don't want to say too much about this because uh, it's a bit, you know, outside of, what, of, of, of uh, uh, you know, some of the things I, I, I know, but, but I think it's kind of uh, interesting and sort of promising uh, area of contact. I think by far the, the sort of biggest uh, promising kind of work is the application of machine learning to uh, uh, phenomenological models of physical systems that are basically systems with emergent properties. So um, there's a lot of uh, you know materials we're trying to design for I don't know for batteries for uh, you know catalysts for chemical reactions or or things like that, right? or semiconductor metamaterials, optical, electro-optical materials, things like that, right? So we, can, we could design materials like atom by atom 
And the problem with this is that we cannot pre predict their properties very well. Uh, we can do, you know, uh, uh, you know, electron density simulation and stuff like that, but um, but we cannot really predict their properties very well. And there's a lot of materials for which you know they have properties that were discovered a little by accident, and 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 it took a long time for people to really understand what was going on. Uh, one example is this uh, uh, magic angle superconductivity. So you take a, a single atomic layer of graphene. Okay, so graphene is just you know a bunch of hexagonal carbon uh, lattice of carbon atoms. And you put another one on top of it and you twist those two by some magic angle. It's one point something degrees. And all of a sudden it becomes superconductor, right? Um, it has to be at fairly low temperature. Um, but it only works for this magic angle. And like, why, right? Um, and, and so there's a lot of properties like this that are really not explained, they're not predicted. And I think there's a lot of opportunities in uh, training deep learning system to basically predict properties of complex physical systems that would allow us to design, you know, better materials, better uh, drugs, you know, better, uh, um, I don't know, helicopter blades, you know, whatever. That's very, very promising. Uh, thank you. Uh, I saw two questions about the technical question about Z in that, in that part. So the, yeah. Uh, so can you explain the intuition about Z in that part? For example, what is the meaning of Z? In B B Y O L and uh, for Bert, yeah, so the third that's the third question to the from the bottom. Okay, so B Y O L does not have any latent variable. Okay, there's no Z in B Y O L um, because the two representations in B Y O L uh, have to be equal, or one has to be. I mean, you 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 take one representation, run it through a, a neural net that you train, but it's fixed; it doesn't have latent variables, and then you you make the output of that predictor and the other representation equal. So there's no latent variable in, uh, uh, in BYOL. And in fact, the experiment with VicRag that I presented, there is no latent variable either. There's not even a predictor actually. Um, uh, you just okay. make the two representations equal, okay? Yeah, it's a, it's a continuous question is for bird like model, Z might be the position of the mask token. Yeah, so that's a- No, uh, in bird model, no. the, the Z is trivial. Uh, in BERT models, there is no latent variable inside the model. The only place where there is a latent variable in BERT is which of the words are you going to choose? So when BERT produces a prediction for a word, what it produces is a, 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 a distribution, a vector of distribution, right, of, uh, of probabilities, a distribution over words. Uh, and then when you generate text, you have to, you have to sample from that distribution. When you pick one word from that distribution, you are instantiating a latent variable, right? It's basically, you can think of it as a switch that picks which of the words you're going to output at that time. And the position of that switch is a latent variable. You pick a word, you set the switch, that's your latent variable. Now, the problem with this kind of latent variable in BERT is that it's not an abstract latent variable. It's, an, it's a latent variable that is in the space of the outputs. And so it's completely useless because what you want is an abstract latent variable that would allow you, for example, when you when you change it, to change the style of the of the of the text you're producing. Okay, for example, it would say the same thing, but it changed. You know, you change the style. But BERT doesn't have that. You you don't have abstract latent variable in BERT. It's a generative model. Thank you. So uh, the the Z the more questions. So does uh, so the general JPA system needs bi level or multi level optimization to deal with the latent variable Z? Does that pose a problem for optimization? Well, so that I kind of partially answered that already. The, uh, it, again, it depends on your architecture. So if you have a simple predictor, uh, finding the uh, finding the best Z that minimizes the prediction error is going to be relatively simple. You can also use tricks like amortized inference, right? So you can train a neural net that looks at SX and XY and tries to predict the optimal value of Z from SX and XY. Um, and then you can use this as an initialization for your optimization process of the latent variable. Uh, you have to be very careful when you do this to limit the information content of Z, otherwise you get catastrophes, but, um, but, but that's kind of a legitimate way to do this. And that's the trick that uh, variational autoencoders use. Variational autoencoders, they cheat. They look at the output to guess the value of the latent variable, okay? Um, which they make noisy to limit its information content. But, um, but they do that, they do amortized inference. 
Thank you. So continue, there seems to be another question about JAPA, so I might as well have a, So can JAPA frame, uh, that's the last one. I can, I can, do you mind reading it? The very last one. Right, can JAPA framework be applied to learn a unified embedding space for general uh, proposed AI to process various tasks and adapt to new tasks? Or can we construct a unified space for uh, general AI um, to be designed by humans or learned by multitask learning? I think it should be learned, first of all, by multitask learning, I don't know, but certainly learned. Uh, whether there should be a single general space, I don't know either. I mean, perhaps the, I mean, there's one thing I kind of didn't uh, quite explain here, but the, the way the, the word model would store its uh, idea of the state of the world, you could think of this as just, you know, a multidimensional array in a neural net, okay? So your, your world model is some, some neural net and it predicts, you know, a vector or tensor or something. But you could also imagine that what the, the world model does is that it writes into the, into the short-term memory uh, and sort of updates its idea of the state of the world. So for example, um, if I tell, you, uh, I tell you a story, right? And in this story, I tell you that uh, John is in the kitchen and uh, there is a, a, a bottle of milk in the kitchen and, um, and you know, Jane is in the, is in the, the backyard Okay, and uh, now Jane moves to the kitchen. Okay, now you know that there are two people in the kitchen. Um, because, and what you did is that, you know, you, you updated your, your sort of current idea of the state of the world, right? You can do this by basically updating the content of some associative memory. So I think that's really the process that should be used to keep a, a track of the state of the world, not just uh, store the entire state of the world in a vector, but basically have the world model write to an associative memory and update whatever is you know required to uh, to update. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, now it's almost eight forty, so we still seven minutes from you. Just, uh, just one more question. Yeah. Uh, do you mind? Well, it's up to you if you want to ask answer one more question. So you you answer. Uh, just one more. I actually have to uh, give a talk tomorrow at nine thirty. So. Uh. <laughs> Okay. I need to get some sleep at some point. So who wanted to ask the last question? So I, I'm not going to pick. So whoever. And so actually, there's the one in the, in the chat box, the last question. So uh, you mentioned contrastive learning cannot scale to larger dimensions. How large is large? For example, BERT latent dimension is 780, 768. BERT is tiny. Uh, the latent dimension of BERT is not like the, the relevant dimension in BERT is not the latent, uh, is, is not the, the code inside of the, the network. Uh, it's uh, what is the dimension of the variable you're trying to predict, right? And in, in BERT it's very simple because the, the variable you're trying to predict is discrete. So you can represent a distribution over a discrete set of outcomes. Okay, the output of, of BERT is a bunch of uh, softmax vectors that indicate distributions over words, right? So I can do a softmax over all words in the English dictionary and the Chinese uh, Mandarin dictionary or whatever, right? Um, I cannot do a softmax over all possible video frames. That is just impossible, okay? Because it's a high dimensional continuous space. I cannot discretize it in any useful way. I cannot represent it by any kind of common distribution like a Gaussian or something like that. Uh, I just cannot represent a distribution over, uh, certainly not a normalized distribution, uh, over the set of all possible video frames. And so that's, 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 where, that's where contrastive learning fails. But of course, over discrete sets, which is what BERT um, handles, it works. It's easy. We can do softmax with 100,000 different icons. That's easy to do. Very good. So this this concludes tonight's uh, talk and the seminar and all this fun events. And let's all thank the, the speaker, uh, Dr. Yano Kuhn. There's no good way to, to say thank you, and, uh, I, but I will do it. So <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you so much uh, for having me. That was, uh, that was fun. Uh, thanks for organizing. Uh, thanks for everyone who woke up early or are going to bed late. <laughs>
Thank you. Okay. Yeah. See you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Take care.